بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي ويا سيدي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا 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 روحي وأرواح العالمين لك الفداء وأقل الفداء يا ليتنا ثم يا ليتنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما بر محمد وال محمد صلوات الله ما شاء الله محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد الله الله محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين سفن النجاة الأعلام من ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلف عنها هلك وغلق ثم أما بعد respected islands brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. Before I yesterday we were talking about the importance of taking the mission and the message of Imam Hussein outside the Imam Bar, outside the confinement of our Husseiniyat and mosque and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of emphasis on this and importance at the same time why we need to do this. But Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad salawat. Muhammad wa must take the message of Imam Hussein outside the Imam Barga is not an attempt to force people to comply with our ways of thinking or with our methodology of worship. Rather, it is an attempt to give an opportunity to the opposite side to know who we are and what we stand for. Why I say this? Because people are often ignorant about those that they don't know. So if I'm not known in the community and the society I live in, by default, there will be prejudice against me. Right? We were never told in the Quran to force people to follow anything. For example, not even Rasulullah has this uh, authority. Allah in the Quran, in the most emphatic terms, and in the clearest of terms, he speaks to his prophet and he says to him, Lasta alayhim bi musaytir. Ya Rasul Allah, you have no authority over them. Okay? So what is your task as a messenger? He said, you are just here to inform. You are just here to inform. You are just here to live a life of dignity, a life of integrity, a life of principles, a life where it actually shows people what it means to be a human being, right? And we have so many examples about this, about the life of the Prophet He himself 
was a paradigm, was an exemplary fellow, uh, 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 figure for us to follow and model our life around his life, right? Allah says that in the Quran. He says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Surely in the Prophet of God, you had an excellent example, right? An excellent example in what? What was the Prophet a role model of? Just religion? The way he prayed was immaculate? The way he fasted was immaculate? The way he performed? No, it's not about rituals. The Prophet was an example for every walk of life. For the way you should interact in the community. For the way you should speak to others. For the way you should interact with children, with women, with neighbors, everything, you name it, the Prophet was an example for. It is stated in history that the Prophet once in Medina was walking and he came across a group of young people like these beautiful faces here. Right? One of them smiled back at the Prophet. Something we don't know, by the way. I don't know what happened to Muslims, but they forgot to smile. They wrapped up their smiles and chucked it in an ocean. Although smiling is an act of charity, you know? The Prophet says, smiling in the face of your brother is an act of charity. <coughs> now when the ulama came to speak about the, the word brother, the alims, they said, what sort of a brother is the Prophet referring to in this hadith? Is it brother by blood? Is it brother by faith? Or is it brother by humanity? What sort of brotherhood, right? They were unanimous in saying that in that hadith, the Prophet was preferring to brothers in humanity. Not brothers in blood, not brothers in faith. Right? Because that's the least act of charity you can do and it costs you nothing. Right? In fact, scientists had proven that it takes less muscle to smile than to frown. Do you know this? Scientifically proven. So if you want to frown, you're going to age much, much quicker than your own age. So smile. On both ends, you will gain charity and you will remain youthful, right? And of course, in the course of doing that, you will always appeal to your wives, right? Because you'll remain young. And this is something also we need to keep in mind. Keeping that figure of youthfulness in you is of paramount importance. I'll come across another riwayah about a friend of Imam Ali that talks about this. But now I'm talking about something else. So he came across a group of young Children, one of them smiled at the Prophet So the Prophet reciprocated. He smiled at him and he asked him a question. Look, it shows that the Prophet was not above engaging in dialogue with anyone. Whether I agree with him or disagree with him. Whether he's older than me or younger than me. I am here to engage and interact with one and all. Right? So he said, do you love me? He's asking that young boy, eight, nine years, do you love me? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, I do. He said, do you love me more than your dad? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, do you love me? Listen carefully to the conversation, brothers and sisters, because that young boy is going to say something in the end. It's going to shake you. So he says, do you love me more than your mother? He says, yes, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than my mother. He said, do you love me than your own self? He says, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He says, is your love to me equal to that of Allah? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, that does not belong to you or to anyone after you. Because no one can be like Allah. Look at this. That the young man speak. He said, that does not belong to you or to anyone else. That only belongs to Allah. Then look what he said. He says, and let me tell you something, Ya Rasulullah. My love to you is on account of my love to Allah first. Allah. He is the ultimate love. He is the ultimate love. When you can realize that Allah is the ultimate lo love, then nothing will be withheld from him. Then you will be willing to give everything to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala.
If he is the ultimate love, then nothing falls short of giving anything to him. And that's why our Imams never fell short of giving anything to Allah. Like I said yesterday, that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad al laim you know, the governor of Kufa, when the Sabaya, you know, the woman folk of Ahlul Bayt, Sayyidah Zainab, Sayyidah Ruqayya, Sayyidah Sukayna, Rabab, you know, all these women, they brought Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad makes a very horrible statement to Sayyidah Zainab, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. He says, <coughs> He says to her, كيف رأيت سنع الله بأخيك وبالمردة العتاد من أصحابه? How did you find or see what Allah has done to your brother and to the recalcitrant and rebellious party of his companions? Yani he's calling Imam Hussein what? A rebel, right? A rebel. She said, Wallah, ma ra'aytu illa jameela. She said, by God, I only saw beauty. But you know what, Ya Ubaidullah ibn Ziyah? You wait because there is a day of judgment where you will be presented before Allah and then we will see who is the ultimate winner. Who is the ultimate winner? You think you've won the battle? Wait until you see what is waiting for you on the day of judgment. See, this is the kind of faith we must entertain in ourselves and in our families. This is how we need to introduce Karbala and the figures of Karbala and the vigor they had about their faith and how they were willing to sacrifice and give everything for the sake of Allah. And their ego never came in between. Their ego, their self, was never an issue. Imam al-Baqir, salawatullah wa alayhi, just to give you examples of how our Imams lived in terms of practicality. Because we are not living Islam in a practical way. We are not living Islam in a practical way. We are living Islam in a ritualistic way. We need to shift the paradigm from ritual to practical. Right? We need to introduce Islam to our children in a practical way. I cannot expect my son not to tell a lie if I practically teach him a lie. Right? How? Simple. Someone calls me home. I don't want to take the call. That young boy is taking the call. Baba, uncle is on the phone. <laughs> this is practical lying. What you're doing, you are teaching your son practically how to lie. You know why? Because we do not have that transparency that can I actually take the call and freely feel the ease to say to the, th that person on the other end, I'm sorry, I cannot take the call now, I'm busy. You know why? Because he's going to make a mockery out of me tomorrow in the mosque or in the Imam Bagh. I called so-and-so and he did not have the audacity to even take my call. You know what? Then you don't know the Quran. You know why you don't know the Quran? Of course not you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> because the Quran says not only if you call. There were no forms then. Right? But the Quran says if you come to the doorstep of someone and you are told by the owner of the house, go back, I can't meet you, then go back and don't make an issue. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ ارْجِعُوا فَرْجِعُوا The Quran says there are certain etiquettes that needs to be followed and in following these etiquettes there should be no repercussions or negativity on the person practicing them. <coughs> right? Look at Imam al-Baqir. Someone from Sham. I don't need to speak more about Sham. When you say something from someone from Sham, on, during those days it means what? He doesn't like Ahlul Bayt. Simple. Because the machinery, the media machinery then was worse than Fox News of today. Okay? It's, it's, it's a fact. It's a fact. So this man comes and he is entering Medina. Imam al Bakr is also in the vicinity of the borders of Medina. And this man looks at Imam al Bakr, he recognizes him. He knows him somehow. He says, Antal Bakara. Yeah, those who understand Arabic, Baqarah in Arabic means what? Cow. He says, you are the cow? Imam al-Baqir looks at him and he smiles. He says, no, I'm al-Baqir. They call me 
al-Baqir, the one that opens knowledge and then extrapolates its gems. That's my name. So imagine if someone comes to me and says, you are the Baqarah. Me, me, I'm not talking about anyone. What would be my reaction towards that person? Right? Aba Amama, Wabaya, graduate of Hausa. I think now I'm something. Right? And this guy is calling me what? A cow. I'll probably lose it. Right? God forbid. Because it's easier said than done. Right? Now I'm saying it, maybe I'll say, yeah, I'll hold my temper. But when it happens, only Allah knows what my reaction is going to be. Until or unless I melt in the religion of Islam and melt in the principles of Islam and melt myself in the examples of my Imams. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. Don't allow my ego to take the better of me. So that man doesn't stop it. He says, I see, so you are the son of the cook? He's referring to the mother of the Imam. He said to him in Arabic, Anta ibn tabbakha. You know, Arab, according to Arab customs and tradition, when you speak with a man, you don't bring his female family members into the conversation. It's very bad. So to take the name of someone's mother in vain and to say it in a ridiculing way, to say you are the son of the cook, the one that cooks in the kitchen, look what Imam al-Baqir said. قَالَ هِيَ حَرْفَتُهَا That's her profession. Allahu Akbar. قَالَ أَنْتَ إِبْنُ السَّوْدَاء You are the son of the black woman. You know, the mother of Imam al-Baqir was a Nubian, you know, from the borders of uh, Africa, okay? From the borders of Africa. You know, once I was in a community, look how far we have left Islam. I was in a community once, and there were two of our own brothers debating with one another about a particular issue. So they came to me to arbitrate. One is saying to the other <laughs> that some of our Imams were dark-skinned. They were what? Dark-skinned. The other guy said, impossible. Our imams cannot be dark-skinned. And if they are, I don't want to follow them anymore. <laughs> Can you imagine the level of ignorance? So they came to me and they said, is it true what this man is saying? I, I think this guy is, is, is saying heresy. You know, he's on the brink of kufr. Astaghfirullah. Just for saying that the imams are a bit dark. I said, no, actually, Imam al Qadim is, Imam al Baqir is, because their mothers were from Africa. He said, no, Sheikh, please don't say that. Where do you stand in terms of the creation of Allah when someone comes with such a paradigm? What do you say to someone like that? What do you say to someone that he actually believes there is a distinction between colors in community? after 1400 years of Islam fighting against discrimination. Where, how, do, how do you preach to these people? What do you tell them? What do you say to them, right? Preach discriminating on the basis of color or gender or background or even religion. I'm gonna take it that far, right? Why that far? Because Imam Ali is what? Is the spoken Quran. And Quran is the silent Quran. The Quran that we have between the two covers is the silent Quran. The spoken Quran, meaning what? The interpreter of the verses of the Quran. The one who actually put these verses into action is none other than who? Than Ali ibn Abi Talib. He appoints Malik al-Ashtar as a governor of Egypt, right? Malik al-Ashtar comes to Imam Ali and says, Ya Imam, you know these Egyptians are funny people. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but good that she laughed. You understood the lecture. He said, he said, these Egyptians are diverse. They are agnostics, atheists, Christians, Jews, Muslims. I'm a Kufa. I'm from Kufa, you know? I'm the son of Islam, right? I was brought and bred and taught by you. I'm your student. How do I deal with these people? 
how do I deal with this diversity? Right? So diverse. Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Jew, atheist, agnostic, a walk, an array of different belief systems. Imam Ali gives him a statement from two sections, from two parts. This statement should be hung on the entrance of every parliament in the world. You want to talk about democracy? You want to talk about equality? You want to talk about human integrity? You want to talk about human development? You quote these two statements by Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu wa sallam He says, oh, Ya Malik. <coughs> Make your salawat louder, brothers and sisters. He says, Ya Malik, an nasu sunfan, imma akhun laka fi deen, aw nadirun laka fi al khalq. He says, Oh Malik, people are of two kinds. There is no third kind among the human race. There are only two kinds. Either your brother in faith, Yani you belong to the same religion, or you're equal in humanity. Mm. Allah is your equal in humanity. What is the message that the Imam is telling Malik al Ashtar? <coughs> if there are only two kinds of people, the first kind, your brother in faith, and the second kind is your brother in humanity, why do you need to discriminate? There's, you have no right. Right? Because if he is not your brother in faith, then he is your equal in what? You are not better than him. Because the judge is who? The judge is Allah, not me. Right? The judge is Allah, not me. I cannot judge people as to who is better and who is greater. Allah says in Surah Al Hujurat, yesterday I said it. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Allah says, We have created. What? Women and among his sides. Oh, yeah, and you nas, all people. You know, in the Quran, there are three kinds of addresses. Ya and you have nas, ya and you have ladina amanu, ya and you have kafiru. When Allah speaks about ya and you have kafiru, non Muslims, He's not talking to me, right? He's talking about a different kind of people. And He's trying to pass on a message to them. He's not trying to be discriminate against them. But he is calling them by the nature of their own belief system. Look at it from that perspective, not from any other perspective. Ya ayyuh al kafirun is not a derogative term. People think ya ayyuh al kafirun is a derogative term. It's a demeaning term. No, the Allah is stating facts. Oh, you who do not wish to believe. Yani he's giving them freedom of choice or not? Huh? He's giving them freedom of choice or not. You don't want to believe, it's up to you. But there is consequence to every action in life. Even if you're a believer, there are consequences. Right or wrong? Yani, if, if you're a believer, there are no consequences to the question of believing. But once you believe, there are responsibilities that comes with belief. There's no question then after that, oh, that does not apply to me. Then step out of belief. Step out of belief. Go and seek something else, which is your own freedom as well to do so. But there are also consequences, right? So either way, whether you want to believe or you don't want to believe, there are what? Consequences. But at times, there is a common denominator of talk. A common denominator of address, which includes the non-Muslim and the Muslim. And that is what? Ya ayyuhan nas. Meaning, or oh, what? People, which includes who? Everyone. So it is an address that must have the attention of every human being. So Allah is speaking to his creation. Ya ayyuhan nas, all people who have created you from a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes, so that you may come to know one another. The art of an interaction. You know, we have a hadith, sometimes in Islam, we use numbers. The usage of these numbers is not to restrict the reward to the number. It is to show how great it is. Right? Yani, for example, if you say a particular tasbih, 70,000 malaika will write it for you. But why can't they be 71? It's a question, it's not about number. Right? The question is that Allah is showing his gratitude 
in rewarding you abundantly. That's what it is. And the number 70 is a big number to the Arabs, so it's a number. It does not mean that if Allah, for example, if Allah says, I'm going I'm to make them 80, you're going to say, no, Ya Allah, you said 70. No, it's not about that, right? It's not about that. And sometimes people become so pedantic that, you know what, oh, we missed, is it 99 tasbih we did or 100 tasbih? Let's start again. Are you serious? Do you think Allah is going to stand and wait for, ah, you only did 99, got you! <laughs> Allah doesn't deal with his humanity like this, or on that basis, right? Allah is more over accepting of his creations, right? So, ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa unsa, wa ja'alnakum sha'uban wa qaba'ila ta'arafu. We made you into nations and tribes that you may come to know one another. There is an art of knowing one another in Islam. And it amounts to one's half religion, just like marriage. You know, man tazawwaja faqad ahraza The one that marries, he has completed half of his religion. So if he takes two, he completes all his religion? No, don't, don't take funny ideas. All right? Because some people play on words, right? They play on words. So there is a similar saying like this about uh, having your half of your religion. It means, it seems that way. It seems that if you master the two, then you've completed your religion. If you get married, you have half of your religion. And then there is the other half, which includes the marriage life and the public life. What is that? Rasulullah says, and our scholar can verify the hadith, our alim. It says, Mudaratun nas nisfu deen. Mudaratun nas nisfu deen. To be able to master the art of interaction and sociability amounts to half of your religion. You know, if you go out today and make a survey in all the companies in the world, and you ask the CEOs of all the companies, what is the biggest expenditure the company pays when they set up a company? Is it the wages for the workers? They say no. Is it buying products? They say no. He said, what is it? He says, PR, public relations. Public relations, right? And it's an actual subject that is taught in universities, right? You can get a degree in PR, public relations. No wonder why the prophet is saying, half of your religion is PR. How to be able to interact with people, to talk to them, to draw them towards you, to your positive energy and let go of your negative energy, you know? This is all in our faith because then you can have a successful marriage if you are good at PR, right? If you know how to talk to your wife, Imam al-Sadiq says what? One word to say, you say to your wife, she'll never forget it for the rest of her life. They said, yeah, Imam, what is it? He said, say to her, I love you. Is it too hard? We're not talking about Titanics now. It's the Imams who are saying this. We are not talking about Twilight Zone, you know? We are talking that our principles are founded within our faith. You know what phases me sometimes is you go to someone's Facebook and you say, my favorite, my favorite singer is Justin Bieber. My best book is Najul Bala. Huh? <laughs> Are you all right? Seriously, what is wrong with you? What is going on? You must have frequency distortion because the two cannot come hand in hand. You know, my favorite singer is Justin Bieber, but my favorite book is Najul Bala. How do they synchronize? Right? It is because there is an imbalance in our intellectual way of looking at our religion. We think we have to import things from outside in order to complement our religion. No, our religion is complete. And the completion of our religion was crowned by the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu alayhi wa that Eid al-Ghadir is not celebrated like Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. It is unfortunate. You know why? I tell you why. Because when you celebrate Eid al-Fitr, you're celebrating it after the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is all of religion or part of religion? What is it? Part of religion. So you are celebrating all of religion or part of religion? Part. Eid al-Adha comes after the season of Hajj. Hajj is part of religion or all of religion? 
Part of religion. When you celebrate Eid al-Adha, you're celebrating all of religion or part of religion? Part of religion. But when it comes to Eid al-Ghadir, what does Allah say? اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. So you are celebrating part of religion or all of religion? All of religion, right? All of religion, the, com the, the, the accomplishment of religion of Islam was completed on the day of appointing Ali ibn Abi Talib عليه, as the head of the Muslim community. But look at this concept. Look at this concept. <coughs> Even to Imam Ali, the fallacy we have in our heads as followers of Imam Ali sometimes is that this is the reason we give for why Imam Ali did not rise. And by the way, this is academic, I'm not talking about sectarianism, because I hate it. I hate to talk Sunni Shia business, all right? On the contrary, Muharram, Eid al-Ghadir itself, Ashura, you know, any occasion in the Mubahal should be a cause of Muslim unity, not Muslim disunity. In any event we celebrate this, we must emphasize first and foremost on the unity of Muslims, not on the disunity of Muslims. Not to come to the member and speak about differences in order to hype up emotions to such an extent that I would go out and want to, you know, just finish the whole world or half of the world. Although I share so many things with these ones that I want to annihilate, right? That's Imam Ali, sallallahu alayhi wa He's the one, you know what they call Imam Ali? The father of unity, sallallahu alayhi wa In a hadith that he sends to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. You know who Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was appointed against the will of Imam Ali to arbitrate on behalf of Imam Ali in Safin with Amr ibn al-As, right? So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and Amr ibn al-As, they started debating that how we're going to end this uh, dispute and the battle of Jihad. So Imam Ali sends him a letter. He says, listen, if you think you and your likes are more concerned about the unity of Islam and Muslims more than Ali ibn Abi Talib, then you have un misunderstood the whole message of Rasulullah. For there is no one who is more concerned about the unity of the Muslims after Rasulullah more than me, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He tells him, don't get funny ideas. Don't think that I'm not concerned about the Muslim. But you know what? Some of the things or analytical definitions or interpretation that are given, why did the Imam not rise? He says, because he didn't have enough supporters. Who are you kidding? Says, Come on. Imam Ali could not have 40 people to stand by his side after the demise of the Prophet. Is that logical? It is illogical. He is Ali ibn Abi Talib. So why didn't he rise? Because Ali ibn Abi Talib does not wish to be in a post where he is not wanted. You want me, I'll come. You don't want me, it's your choice. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his own sovereign entity, he says what? He says, I don't want people to worship me by force. I want people to worship me by choice. In two places this came in the Quran. One is a Medinian ayah and one is a Meccan ayah. In the Medinian ayah that was revealed in Medina, so that Orientalist or Orientalist, I want to talk to our youth. When you are being debated and put under the hammer about Islam being spread by the edge of the sword, don't buckle. Don't buckle. No, stand firm and say, this is a myth. Yes, if you are talking about Arab expansionism, that happened under the sword. I've got nothing to do with it. Two separate issues, right? Two separate issues. Arab expansionism happened at the behest of who? Bani Umayyah and Bani Al-Abbas. They were not working for religion, these two dynasties. They were working for the expansion of what? Arab nationalism, pan-Arab nationalism. Had nothing to do with Islam. And due to that, in order to be able to be successful in that mission, what did they do? They started a movement called the Movement of Fabricators of Hadith. The Movement of Fabricators of Hadith. So what did they do? They paid people, just like, not all, some journalists of today, you know, they are told, create some news, something sensationalism, you know? 
Just test the waters. So they come up with something absurd. The first day it gets rejected. The second day, third day, fourth day, it becomes normal. People accept the term, accept the line, right? Same thing happened with the dynasty of Bani Umayyah and Bani Al-Abbas. Fabricate things. One of these fabrications is what? If you go against the leader of the government, you become what? A renegade. Murtad. Kill him. Right? Kill him. Kill him under what law? Under what law? Let's examine the law of the Quran. Does Allah say anything in that regard? <laughs> what does Allah say in Mecca? Let's start with Mecca because Orientalists put a claim out. What is the Orientalist claim? Ah, yes, your religion was peaceful when it started in Mecca. But when it gained momentum and power in Medina, it lost its peace. Because the Prophet led three battles and almost 17 or 18 skirmishes. So he was bloodthirsty. I said, hold on. <coughs> Let's look at the Quran first. What does Allah say in the Quran? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in Surah Al-Kafirun. Meccan or Medinian? Meccan. Why? Because it was revealed in Mecca. And the characteristics of Meccan chapters is what? Is that first, they deal with aqidah, they deal with faith, belief, and they're short. Short in nature. Three, four verses. Five, six verses. They're not long like the Medinian. Why? Because the Medinian is now law. There is a government, there are laws that need to be observed, there is interaction with different, you know, part of life, different part of faith, different type, type communities, so there has to be extensive laws that are being discussed. In Mecca, straightforward, it's a matter either you believe or you don't believe. Either you're a Muslim or you are an un-Muslim. So let's examine. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to make it short. Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun. Start it. Or you who don't want to believe. La a'budu ma ta'budu. Okay, now. Now, in Mecca, we are living together. La a'budu ma ta'budu. Okay, in future. In future, neither you will worship what you, uh, neither I will worship what you worship, nor you will worship what I worship. Now, how do we end this debate? This is a debate or not? It's a debate. Who summed up the debate? Allah. What did he say? Let's kill one another. Did he say that? He ended the debate in the most humane way. He said, Lakum dinukum waliyah. You have your religion, and I have mine. End of the story. No altercations, no batons, no firearms, no swords, no shields, no cutting of heads, nothing. You have your religion, and I have my religion. Okay, now, ah, Prophet Muhammad is weak. He can't fight all the Meccans and the Arab, you know, tribes. Okay, let's go to Medina. The Prophet now is a statesman or not? Head of a state? Head of a state. Medina has borders? Yes. He has allegiances with the Jews of Medina? He signed treaties? Yes. He signed treaties with the Christian of Najran? Yeah, he signed treaties with the Christian. No, now he's what? It's a state. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to the Prophet, now that you are in control, here is another ayah about interaction of faith. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La ikraha fi al-deen. Qad tabayyan al-rushdu min al -ghay. There is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands clear from falsehood. Whoever wants to believe and hold fast to the truth, then he has held to the rope of Allah and to the knot of belief. End of the debate. No killing. No annihilation, no nothing. So tell me, how was Islam spread by the edge of the sword? Okay. Badr. Badr? They attacked us. Hello? We were in Medina doing nothing. Okay. Uhud, revenge for the loss of Badr. Khandaq, they came up with a plan. We must finish this prophet. Right? So they signed a treaty with all the Arab tribes. You know, you all join us and they seduce some of the infiltrators within Medina to cooperate with them to what finish the Prophet altogether and his message. So the Prophet, he did not even fight in Khandaq. Allah sent a wind, destroyed all these parties and they went back to where they came from. Look at the beauty of how the battle started in all three major battles of Islam. 
Every time the battle starts, it was an Arab custom that Islam endorsed. When the two parties come, you send out three men on a jewel. Okay? On a jewel. So Imam Ali comes out, Al Harith, the cousin of the Prophet, comes out, and Al Hamza comes out in battle. You know? If a leader brings out his family members, he's confident about what he's doing or not. He didn't bring any of his companions. He brought Ali, his own self, Hamza, his uncle, and Al Harith, who is the cousin of the Prophet. He said to his companions, Stay back. Don't fight. It's not your fight now. I want to show these people that I'm as confident as they can see this sun. So I bring my family members out. This is a leader. Huh? Not the leader who sits under behind closed doors, I don't know where, and you know, by the push of the button he wants to fight. Huh? And when the first sign of attack comes, he flies with a private jet, I don't know where. Okay? This is leadership. Huh? Allahu Akbar. Anyway, so uh, the, the Prophet himself is in the battlefield. So Imam Ali speaks to those, you know, big giants of Quraysh. He says to them, listen, you came to fight us, we didn't come to fight you. So I'll give you three options. So what's the first option? He said, become Muslims like us. Simple. Join us. No. If we wanted to believe in your Muhammad, we would not have come to fight you. Fair enough. Okay. Next, he said, go back from where you came from because we are not thirsty for blood. We want to live in peace. Allah Akbar. Better option than this? He said, no, that will not give you up. He said, so what do you want? He said, fight. He said, come. I mean, if that's what you want, you know, then I'm ready. If that's what you want, after all this option. In Khanda, the same thing happens. Amr ibn Wid. Amr ibn Wid ibn Amr, you know, or Amr ibn, uh, uh, ibn Wid ibn al -al Amr. He comes. Again, Imam Ali says, three options. Go back from where you came from. Amr ibn Wid says, is this a joke? And you know what? Initially, Amr ibn Wid says to Imam Ali, he says, listen, I know your dad. I have so much respect for your dad. I don't feel like killing you. Imam Ali says, let's not talk about killing now. Let's talk. Let's have a dialogue. Huh? My Quran says, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا We made you into nations strive so that you may come to know one. Let's talk to one another. He said, okay. I, 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 I respect that you are the son of Abu Talib. Abu Talib was respected and you should be awarded the same respect as your father. He said, good. Now we're talking. He said, what's the first option? He said, become a Muslim. Again. Again. He says, no. Second, he says, go back from where you came from. So all these tribes, they came with their entourage and their women and their, you know, uh, weapons to annihilate you. You're telling me to go back? That's shame for an Arab. He says, so what do you want? Is this fight? Is it fight? Fight. What can I do for you? Fight. He finishes it. Right? But he does not finish his hymn for his own ego, because you know the story, right? You know the story? Amr ibn Wad falls, pits in the face of Imam Ali. Imam Ali gets up and goes, takes a three, four walks and rounds. The Muslims are, you know, are in tears. They are in awe, in absolute fear. Allah describes this in Hanajir. Your heart reach your throats from fear. Well, Imam Ali is going around, you know, in circles, and then he comes back, goes into a duel with Amr ibn Wad. Again, he kills him. The Muslims after that say, "What were you doing? Why didn't you finish him when you where?" He said, "Ah, he spat in my face. I don't do things for myself. Allahu, I don't do things for myself. If I had killed him, maybe it was for myself. I'd have revenge." Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Imams are not for themselves. They are for the whole world, for Allah. Huh? He is the one who sent his son, Hussein ibn Ali, sallallahu to, 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 uh, to, uh, uh, in Karbala. He spoke to Allah, he says, Take until you are satisfied. So he wanted him, right? The riwayah says, what? I haven't finished. Wallah, it feels like I haven't started yet. Right? <laughs> Muki, sir. Okay, I won't make you dookie tonight. Over the next few nights, I will. Musiba. The Musiba is so heart rendering that when the Imam وسلم, wants to leave Medina and he's preparing everything, as I said yesterday, the caravans, you know, the camels, all the entourage came out. 
You know, it says in some riwayat, Imam Ali started naming the members of Ahlul Bayt. Ya Ruqayya, Ya Um Kurtu, Ya There was one little girl that didn't hear her name. She was waiting. Fatima to Zuhr, as you call her Fatima to Alina, the sick Fatima, the ill Fatima, you know? Now he says, she was going from one room into another. Wherever Imam Hussein goes, she follows him. Why? With anticipation that the Imam may call her name. Salawatullah. Wa salam The Imam knows. Salawatullah wa salam. He has a feeling that she's waiting in anticipation for her name. But he doesn't mention. He, he acts like she. He doesn't. He, he's not witnessing or he's not observing what she's doing. Then, after they all go on the back of the camel, Fatima al-Ali comes. She says, oh, Abata, my darling Hussein, it seems that my name has not been listed or called to be with you in this trip. What is the story of oh, my father Hussein? You have caused my heart to bleed, and my emotions are running out of patience. Imam Hussein then holds Fatima to Alila. He draws her close to his chest, and he says, "My darling Fatima, you are sick and ill, and I'm." to take you with me for the journey is rough and long. You know what she says to her father? He says, it doesn't matter. Take me as a servant. <laughs> Let me serve the caravan. If you don't enumerate me as one of the family members, I'll become a servant. It doesn't matter. I'll serve you. Imam Hussein re-emphasizes on the point that she is sick, she is ill. Look what she comes up with, what proposal. Salamullah alayha, because she's eager, she's attached to her father, Imam Hussein. Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. She says to him, then leave Ali al-Azhar with me. Leave my baby brother, I will look after him. I promise I will not make him go hungry or thirsty or ill or anything. I'll give all to him. He says, how could an infant baby remain without? the comfort of his own mother, my darling Fatima. So he goes, he started going out. The camel starts to ride again. Fatima al-Alila is sitting at home. Then she realizes that the caravan has actually left. So she comes out and runs towards Imam Hussein salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Imam Hussein comes down from his horse. He holds her close to his heart and he says, what brings you out, oh Fatima? She says, I have one request. She said, what? He said, send after me when you settle down. <laughs> By then, my health would have come back to me. He said, that I promise. I promise if things go well and we settle down, I will. The caravan leaves. Fatima al Alina is sitting, waiting for the news to come. One path, one month has passed. The second month or half had passed. Nothing happens. Imam Hussein is in the middle of the battle. He's looking left, right, and center, and, and, center, and he's saying one word: Allah al min Is there anyone that will come to our rescue? Is there anyone that will come to our help? All of a sudden, someone brings him a letter. You know, there used to be people traveling in and out. So he brings him a letter. He opens the letter. He begins to cry. Salawatullah. Wa salamu alayhi. Zainab observes Imam Hussein. She says, Akhaya, ma alladhi yubkik? Ya kurrata aini, ya bna ummi wa abi. O son of my father and mother, O the joy of my eyes. Why are you crying? He said, I just received a letter. She said, so what is the big deal about the letter? Who is this letter from? He says, it is from Fatima al-Alila. It's 
voice from Fatima saying, Oh, Father, you have not fulfilled your promise. No one came after me. And then he says the following words to say, the Zainab Salawatullah Alaihi Wasallam says, She broke my heart. She says, Why? She said, She's asking about her uncle, Abu Fadl al Abbas. And she's sending her greetings to him. Then she, he says, And now she's asking about Ali ibn al what would Fatima Al-Alila do if she had heard there and then that Ali Al-Azhar was killed from one vein to another and his head was raised on the top of a lance Rahim Allah Mannada on those who cry out, Wa Husayna, Wa Imama, Wa Gariba, Wa Mazluma, Inna Lillah, Wa Inna Ilayhi Rajiun, Wa Sayyadamu Ladina Zalamu, Ayya. Brothers and sisters, quickly, if I have taken a bit of your time, just five minutes over my limit, two minutes of your time, five times, Amman Yujib, we have a lot of people, I've just received a phone call or a text message from someone who has fallen ill in a tragic circumstances, and may Allah, inshallah, grant him life, he's very, very critical in Boston, America. One of our community members, 30 years old, please remember him in your du'as and in this you know, ayah of shifa. And to all those who have no one to pray for them, let us also include them in our du'as. Your family members, your late parents, if you have late parents, if you have current parents, pray for them also within the barakah of this ayah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibun mutarra ila da'a wa yakshifu suru. Amman yujibun mutarra ila da'a Last time with the loudest of your voices, by the right of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and by the right of Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha, proceeded with salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah.